Historical trivia. Victoria's path to the British royal throne. It may seem a bit strange, but the most important role in Queen Victoria's ascension to the throne was played by a young princess, without whom it could not have happened. But about that a little later. The story of Victoria's succession to the throne began almost 40 years before her birth. King George III and his wife did a lot to ensure that there were no problems with the succession to the throne, as they had a total of 15 children, 9 boys, and 6 girls. In England and Great Britain, the male preference primogeniture model was in force until recently, meaning that men had prerogatives. What does this really mean? Among the members of the ruling family, women could only be considered as potential rulers if they no longer had male brothers and they had no direct, legal, descendants. It follows from the previous principle that the eldest daughter, who was otherwise born as the fourth child, after the birth of the youngest son, Alfred, could at best only have been tenth on the list of succession to the throne. In 1782, the king commissioned a series of pictures of the family, which for some reason did not include Prince Frederick of York, nor could Amalia, who was born the following year, appear. For the time being, therefore, the daughters were excluded from the succession to the throne, as there were still too many before them to have a serious chance of ruling. In 1782, the king still had 14 children, when Alfred, the youngest son, and Octavius, the second youngest son, died unexpectedly six months later. A few months later, Amalia, their last child, was born, but nothing was the same. The king was greatly affected by the death of his two young sons, he could not let them go for months, and then a few years later, he showed signs of insanity for the first time. His eldest son took over his duties as regent, and the question of succession to the throne came up more and more, since the king did not yet have a grandson, even though his oldest children were well over twenty. Of course, this is not entirely true, because he had an illegitimate grandson, but it could not play a role in the succession to the throne. The first five in the order of succession to the throne were George, Frederick, William, Edward, and Ernest Augustus, from whom they were expected, mainly, the successors. Frederick, the second son, was the first to step in, and in 1791, he married the Prussian princess Frederica, but they parted ways after barely a year, and the marriage remained childless. The next event, the sixth son, was the marriage of Augustus Frederick in 1793, but according to the marriage law of 1772, marriage could only be concluded with the monarch's permission and anyone who violated this was excluded from inheriting the throne, so Augustus Frederick fell out of the circle. The next step was taken by George, the biggest boy, but he also only because of the money offered by the Parliament. Reluctantly, he did what the Parliament asked, betrothed to Caroline of Brunswick, who happened to be his cousin. He also married her in 1795, and although they had sex three times in total, Princess Sirolta of Wales was born on January 7, 1796, who immediately jumped to second place on the list of heirs to the throne, displacing Ernest Augustus. Everyone calmed down, the heir to the throne was born, so the topic faded into the background. The king's illness came up again and again, especially when his youngest daughter, who had been sick a lot anyway, died in 1810. The Princess of Wales was a vivacious girl, loved by the people, and kept under close supervision by the regent. He offered her countless possible husbands, but the princess chose one of the young princes of a poor German province. After some discussion, in 1816 she married Prince Lippet of Germany, and although she miscarried twice, her third pregnancy went well. The whole country was waiting for the moment when the youngest heir to the throne would be born, but on November 5, 1817, the nine-kilogram boy was stillborn, and the next day at dawn the princess also bled to death. The king was again left without a grandson, and the country without an heir to the throne, because the others did not manage to enrich the family with new, legal, grandchildren either. The closest to this was Ernest Augustus, whose child was stillborn twice. The importance of the case is shown by the fact that the parliament also dealt with the birth of the heir to the throne. The princes were almost ordered to take care of the heir to the throne. 
Edward, who, as the fourth son, did not think that he was involved in the matter, gave in to the pressure and entered the competition, so actually, Queen Victoria owed her existence to the early death of Princess Sarolta, since if she did not die, her father would never marry. The first was the seventh son, Adolf, Duke of Cambridge, who married the German Princess Augusta in Hesse on May 7, 1818, and this was repeated on June 1 in London. The next step was Edward, who married the German Princess Victoria on May 29, 1818. And a month later William, Duke of Clarence also got married, who married the German Princess Adelheid on July 11, 1818. The interesting thing about his wedding is that on that day, Edward remarried Victoria, because his mother was unable to travel to the wedding in Coburg due to her illness. Just one year later, on March 26, 1819, Prince Adolf's son, Prince George, was born, but he received less attention for the time being, as his father was only the seventh son. One day later, on March 27, 1819, Princess Sarolta Augusta, the daughter of Prince Vilmos, was born, who immediately entered the fourth place in the line of succession to the throne, pushing back Princes Edward and Ernest Augustus. After a few hours, however, the little princess died, so the princes could advance again. Two months later, on May 24, 1819, Edward's daughter, Princess Victoria, was born, making her fifth in line to the throne after her father, pushing Ernest Augustus back. Three days later, on May 27, 1819, Ernest Augustus's son, Prince George of Cumberland, was born in Berlin, who was thus placed behind his father in the line of succession to the throne. For a long time, his father planned to marry Victoria and become British king, but since he became completely blind at the age of five, the chance of this was almost completely eliminated. Barely a year passed when, on January 23, 1820, Prince Edward of Kent died of pneumonia, so Victoria could take his place. The king, who had been ill for a long time, died six days after his son, so on January 29, 1820, the regent became the king in name, so Victoria also stepped forward in the line. Eleven months later, on December 10, 1820, Prince William's daughter, Princess Elizabeth, was born, predeceasing Victoria. However, this did not last long, as the little princess died on May 4, 1821, so Victoria returned to her previous position. Barely six years had passed when Prince Frederick died, so Victoria was already second in the line of succession to the throne, and from then on, it was seriously considered that she could be the next ruler. Years earlier, on April 8, 1822, Vilmos and his wife's twin sons were stillborn, so they accepted that they would not have children. On June 26, 1830, the king died, so Prince Vilmos ascended the throne, and Princess Victoria became the first but temporary heir to the throne, because many believed that the king could still have a child, since his wife was not even 40 years old. On June 20, 1837, the king died, so Princess Victoria became interim queen. However, it soon became clear that the king had no afterborn children, so Victoria officially became the ruler, without the temporary epithet. It was then that the 63-year-old Victorian era began. If you want to see more videos, please subscribe.